Welcome to the second episode of Jamal Belkia Season 12 Recaps from Reality TV Warriors. My name is Michael Armstrong and joining me as always are the Canadian who I think might have lent one of his special videos to Papa Rosso as inspiration for the ice cream challenge, Logan Saunders. Good afternoon. Getting the inevitable fuzzy bingo square of Logan's wiki videos out there within the first 10 seconds of the podcast. And the guy celebrating his 50th episode with us, who as far as we're aware is the only Australian we podcast with who hasn't been to prison, David Bidley. Good morning. They've let me out of the asylum. They have. Michelle's the one who's in prison for, you know, obvious reasons. And Ben's gone missing at this point. Yeah, what? what where's Ben? But Bindles has actually been let out on day release from the asylum to do his 50th episode with us. Yay. I'm just happy it's not a historian's. Yeah. Somehow you haven't got cancelled yet. No. Although after this episode. <laughs> yeah, preemptive cancellation. I wrote that joke long ago. When I knew this was going to be episode 50. So how are you, big fella? Pretty good. Good week? Yeah, it wasn't too bad. Didn't do much, but... I mean, just going behind the curtain slightly, one of us did forget that the clock's changed. Not mentioning any names, but it's not B.L. Bindles. No. <laughs> oh, man. We have to do some real sleuthing here. <laughs> yeah. We were meant to record at 10pm my time, and we got a message off Saunders at 9.50 going... Uh, I'm, I'm not home, eh? But we'll have to delay it by half an hour to 3.30pm. I'm like, 11.30 for me? Really? Really? <laughs> Do have to be up for work. Okay, this once. Don't let this happen again. A lesson has been taught. Good. Right answer. <laughs> Apology accepted. <laughs> And I know people were missing the preamble last week, so I'm going to go straight into it. Given that we did actually forget small administrative error, we forgot to mention that, obviously, the reunion of Vidum was recorded on Bindle's birthday, and it was my birthday when the first episode of this season came out. Mm. Can't imagine how we forgot that. Yeah, I say small administrative error, because the last time I did that, you know what the implication was, Fuzzy? We absolutely knew you were going to make it the centre square, and we absolutely didn't do it last week deliberately. You're welcome. <laughs> I feel like we're breaking the fourth wall here. <laughs> yeah, let's break the fourth wall a little bit more by saying thank you to the copious amounts of people who did remind us of the existence of blended families last week. It's the most messages I think we've had about any topic in years of this podcast. Um, obviously, I do understand how blended families work. The information we were given made it sound like Mikhail had had a child at 11, so we just took it on face value. I'm aware he's a stepfather, thank you. In our defence, Michael is stupid. Yeah, you can stop writing in now. <laughs> that makes a lot more sense. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I did find this out sort of between us recording and editing, and I deliberately didn't mention it to you guys, because obviously I wanted to mention it on the podcast. But yes, I'm aware of how blended families work, I'm aware of stepfathers and how how that works, and the fact that he can be, you know, not the father of uh, a child at the age of 11. The fun bit of this is, of course, that obviously I'm doing two podcasts a week at the moment, and did Hunted yesterday morning, and mentioned this to Michelle and Anne. Obviously, they got a laugh about it. We did do a little bit of testicle chat the streams kind of crossed a little bit the streams crossed are you you're, you're seriously using that wording yeah they were licking in the wrong direction and um i found out a very important piece of information which is the fact that michelle apparently was asked last week to send a podcast episode to her colleagues oh god <laughs> yeah her thought process was genuinely well i'm not going to send any of the early tar episodes with michael and logan because they're a bit too filthy so she sent a hunted one, and then we immediately started doing testicle chat again. <laughs> I think she might have regretted her decision. Oh, Michelle. But the reason that I found out about the stepfather thing before we'd even podcasted about it is actually something that I probably should have mentioned on last week's episode, but I didn't see it in time. In the fact that we got a shout out on Reddit last week. Ooh. What? Thank you to David V, who actually brought this to my attention. He brought this to my attention on Tuesday afternoon, and I, I was busy, so I sort of heard that he'd sent me a message and then didn't look at it until after we'd finished recording. But uh, yeah, on the Belgian subreddit, they do have a live discussion thread for Belgian Mole each week. It's a mix of English and Dutch, which is very nice to see. 
but I would like to um, to say hello to user uses irony correctly, who is a fan of the podcast and was touting the fact that there is a podcast that does it in um, in English with an Australian and a Brit recapping it, which oh. actually almost was true this week. <laughs> so hello to you two, and you know, no love for Saunders there, evidently. And uh, what else is new? <laughs> It's not my fault, I'm a liar. And the uh, the final thing that I do want to mention before we actually do talk about this episode, because obviously we are on a clock, is we don't really talk about my work a lot on the podcast, but I have changed jobs technically yesterday. It's a, a weird situation in the fact that I've not really changed jobs. I've changed job roles and my sub-team has moved to another wider team. A lot of my responsibilities haven't changed, but I've got, but you know, I've technically got a new job this week. Um, but as part of that, my old team sent an Amazon gift card, which was really nice of them. And they also sent me a surprise present through the post last Wednesday because I was out at my uh, my garage getting stuff out for lunch and the postman turned up with a parcel for me. And I'm like, well, it's three days after my birthday. No one's going to have sent a birthday present this late, I don't think. So I wonder what it is. I opened it up and it was a mug from them. It was one of oh. those parody definition mugs of like Michael now. And it had three definitions on it and i want to read them out to you because i want you to kind of work out what what the interpretation that i got from it was and why it made me laugh so much so it says michael noun number one quiz master number two podcaster number three loved and missed by his former team that third point reads awfully like i've died yep that reads like a eulogy to me oh you mean the past tense yeah it reads like a a thoughts and prayers message to me on a mug. As if you're going to get both thoughts and prayers. Well, exactly, yeah. And it's a really sweet thing, and I'm slightly apprehensive about the fact that they put Podcaster on there because I don't talk about the podcast a lot in work for fairly obvious reasons. Look back to last week and all the whole stepfather and testicle chat. But (laughs) if anyone from my former team or current team is listening, hello to you. But it does read a little bit like I've died to me. It made me laugh, but yeah. The thoughts were there, but the prayers aren't necessarily appreciated, I would say, there. So anyway, this episode of Belgian Mole. What an episode. Is everyone the mole? (laughs) I think, collectively, this is the most we have ever struggled to pick some suspects. (laughs) Because, Jesus Christ, everyone. The one person that we all ruled out got executed. Yeah, normally, obviously, I wouldn't cheer for someone from my team going, but... It was a foregone conclusion for all three of us last week. It's kind of hilarious that we were so on the nose with it this week. Mm -hmm. So previously, ten new Belgian strangers hung out on a yacht off the coast of Sicily to begin their search for the mole. A new element in the game in the form of doublos was introduced to test everyone like they'd never been tested before. After a day at the Olive Grove and a psychological game, Bernard proved himself to be the most slippery, earning himself an exemption and control of the doublers, while it was an instant red screen for possibly a woman, Gillian, as he became the first to be sent home. And we flash back to Greece and everyone deciding whether to open Pandora's box or not. It was thrown in the sea at the final reveal location and floated its way to Sicily. How long have they been planning this, seriously? Because they... They discarded it in the Canary Islands. I wonder if they would have considered it using the Canary Islands if it wasn't for, well, because of what happened during the season. Yeah, makes sense. And then there just wasn't a way to fit it in with the Arizona season, because that would just be ridiculous to think a Pandora's box could float all the way to the ocean and somehow get imported into the desert. That's just that's just too far-fetched. Uh, so maybe they just this season was the right time to bring it back when you don't have three people getting medically evacuated or quit. Yeah, because they didn't really draw attention to it, but the first image we see of it in Greece is at the final reveal location, because that is the the little church that Papa Bear posted his picture of to reveal Greece as a location on Instagram. Because I actually sought out that church to try and find it, and it was just in the middle of nowhere when I was in Greece. <laughs> I wanted to take a picture and say, do you remember this, guys? I wish at the end when he has like the black light on the name of the mole is if it just says Alina because they still haven't updated the box and just show Jill DaCosta pulling out a sharpie, crossing out Alina's name and then writing down the name of the mole for this season. I wouldn't be surprised if they do that as a joke. Well, they haven't been able to write it because it's been in the sea. That is a good point. Also, 
it's probably for the best that Gilles brought the black light out for Pandora's box rather than anywhere near Logan for, you know, fairly obvious reasons. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> but last week was testicle jokes. This week it's just going straight C, but don't worry about that. Well, well, look at the ice cream. Look at the ice cream task. My God. Was I watching Belgian Mole or a softcore porno? Jesus Christ. <laughs> there was nothing soft about it. <laughs> it was soft. It was hard. So ice cream. Just like most normal days for uh, for Bindles, it's semen jokes now and then fellatio later. Yeah. So the episode title is Is the Mole Still Left Alive from Caroline? And it is day four in Savaka, which served as the backdrop for some of the scenes of one of the most famous films of all time, The Godfather. Charlotte is too young to know it, apparently. <laughs> yeah, who is this El Padrino person? <laughs> Despite the fact that she's a very similar age to at least two of us. She's not that much younger than us, I don't think. 26, right? Yeah, that's, that's only five years younger than me. Yeah, it's just funny, just her going around, uh, who is this El Padrino person? If I had to describe him, I would say he is a receding hairline guy with mustache. She probably thinks it's Willy Wonka. (laughs) Uh, Senna is apparently more of a classic mafia look, and Bernard is more modern. And Jill tells him he's throwing in a beautiful Italian cliche today, they're going to be eating ice cream. There may be a beautiful gelateria on the town square, but that's not where the ice cream's going to be eaten. It is instead going to have to be transported to a beach eight kilometers away. Each ice cream that reaches him will be worth 250 euros for the pot, as long as it still looks like an ice cream when it gets there. However, given Bernard has the control of the doublers, it can technically be worth 500 euros per ice cream if he wants to use one. He's the only person who gets the choice of whether a doubler is played, and you can only use one per episode. Which are wrinkles that we didn't know about beforehand. No, I, I quite like that it's only one episode. It also goes back to something that I forgot to mention last week in our bumper recording, in the fact that I was wondering whether they could keep one for the finale and there'll be a ridiculous prize in the end of the season. But I think that they probably have to be used by Final Four. Because if you think about it, we saw six of them last week. They couldn't be played in week one because nobody had control of them until the end of the episode. That then leaves six episodes before the finale. So if they don't add any more in, then the intention was that in theory they could play one in episodes two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And then nothing in the finale. So the group needs to split again into five cool cats and four puzzlers. The four puzzlers, which are Senna, Lynn, Bernard and Philippe, will be arranging the transport while the cool cats, Stephanie, Mikael, Charlotte, Coco and Caroline, will be in charge of the ice creams. The bad news for the puzzlers is that their cars are traps and need to get through the classic Italian car puzzle. They must move the badly parked cars forwards and backwards to free the two cars. Now I'm just going to let you guys talk about the ice cream portion because, you know, I'm deferring to the experts here. What could there possibly be to talk about? Um, This task would not have been possible during the COVID seasons. I was thinking that. (laughs) <laughs> this is the least covered friendly challenge they have ever had. Ever. It's like they took a page out of Big Brother Canada's book for this season. In an allegedly family friendly show, this is the nearest the knuckle they have ever done. And that is a very high bar on this show. This is even worse than last year's hot dog sauce ejaculation wall. Exactly. <laughs> If you think how much fun we had with the hot dog sauces, now we have to talk about a challenge where five of them have to lick popsicles, mimicking fellatio to move a thumbprint on a screen to get ice cream scoops that drop from the sky. Funniest thing is it's not even the dirtiest Atari game ever made. (laughs) So yeah, the ice cream eaters must earn as many ice creams as they can by moving a thumbprint to an ice cream symbol in a maze on a screen. Their controller, ice pops that they are pretending are hooked to the electrical mains. This is an underrated bit of this challenge, the fact that they pretend that they're going to give them electric shocks. I was kind of disappointed this wasn't a No Dear Bolly challenge with, like, the... whenever they got the car quiz wrong, instead of losing five minutes, just whoever was blowing the ice cream got shocked to the mouth. (laughs) Or even better, if they got the car keys wrong, just the ice pot moved up slightly. (laughs) (laughs) It just gave him a little gag reflex, you know, just a nudge. (laughs) It's going deeper. (laughs) 
<laughs> Thank you for that wonderful clip, Saunders. <laughs> and I'm going to let Bindles do the joke for the ice pops, even though I had it written down at the same time he said it. This sucking show. Thank you. I love how you knew what I was referring to there as well. So what are the odds that everyone who did the ice cream part of the challenge that the next day they're all going to wake up with herpes? I'd like to think that they swapped the ice pops out each time, but I'm not sure they did. I didn't see any coverings. I think they did change them at least once because sort of halfway through they're basically dead and then all of a sudden they're back to normal. So There were two sets of them. Yeah. So maybe they maybe they alternated the sets and then swapped the ice pops out on the other one. Hmm. But yeah, this was a really grim challenge. <laughs> and we haven't even got to the bit where Michael drops his ball yet. <laughs> and uh, this is the most heated. This is the most biggest confrontation we've seen between two contestants in quite a while, where Charlotte and Coco are just ready to tear into each other, which is just ridiculous given that they're at a the highly suggestive ice cream challenge for this fight to take place. Just, you know, when two people are trying to be super diplomatic in a situation, but they're both very visibly pissed off and how they both have to just apologize to each other repeatedly, even though they don't mean it. That's essentially what happens here. I must admit, I thought Coco was a bit reserved last week. I very much appreciate Coco's added fire this week. She's very argumentative in this entire episode. It's kind of what this cast needs. Yeah. She just needed to turn up the fire a little bit and it's it's made this even better this entire episode. I know this happens further down in the episode where I think it's Mikhail who says uh, suddenly when we have a challenge to do, uh, Coco suddenly understands Dutch a lot less. And I was thinking, that is a brutal burn. That's in the test scene, I think. Yeah. He's like, yeah, Coco's suspicious just because her knowledge of Dutch seems to disappear as soon as she uh, as soon as she gets into a challenge. It's like Frederica Vanderwall in reverse. You gotta give the icy pulse some lead way. <laughs> Me and a friend online just made that joke last week. <laughs> I don't know why that just gets that's the one thing Frederick Vanderwall is known for now is the lead way thing. So when they complete the maze, the scoop of ice cream drops from a pipe above their heads, and they have an hour to get to Jill. For the puzzlers, they can take the car keys of the badly parked cars, but there is a small wrinkle. In each cabinet section, there are two car brand logos, and they must identify if they're Italian or not. An incorrect choice knocks five minutes off the total playing time. It reminds me of Bill Nye the Science Guy, with um, they had uh, Magnetic or Not in one of the Bill Nye episodes that we had to watch in elementary school. So it's just, instead of magnetic or not, it's just Italian or not. How do you think you would have done with the car logos? I did so badly with this quiz. I did pretty good. I didn't recognize the Maserati um, logo, though. But I think there were, very, there were very few that I think the Maserati one I would have screwed up on because I just wouldn't have recognized it. The Saab one I wouldn't ever have recognized. But I think most of the others I did, and I and I knew which ones were um, uh, were Italian. Yeah, it was that last pairing that where I would have been zero for two. I think. I mean, I I couldn't remember that it was Maserati, but I knew it was Italian, so I would have been fine on that one. But car logos are one of those classic pub quiz rounds that that I should know in theory, so I didn't do too badly on it. So Bernard and Lynn are first, and they get Porsche and Peugeot, but don't know that it's Porsche, so get it wrong. And the Cool Cats only have 30 seconds to collect an ice cream, or it will move its position in the maze. And this happens to Caroline twice. Old people and video games. Considering that they moved so quickly, it kind of made it insane that everybody was looking so damn slowly. Like, they were taking like two, three seconds just to move one space. Like, lick faster, damn it. Yeah. There's probably an element of brain freeze in there as well. Because <laughs> I don't know how warm it was in Sicily in October, but it's probably still pretty pretty nice. The Mediterranean doesn't tend to be that cold in October, even as late as November. But, yeah, there was probably an element of brain freeze in the fact that it was maybe 20 degrees outside, 15, 20 or something like that, and then you're having to deep throw an ice pop. Well, you don't have to, but it helps. To get the perfect control, it seems you had to in this challenge. They're probably hesitant, because they it, they must have gone through their minds how this was going to look on TV. Oh yeah, and Michael didn't care. 
Yeah, Mikael leaned into it. He's like, I am 41 years old. I'm a grandfather. I'm a stepfather and a father. I remembered this time, guys. And the grand, no, no, stepfather and a grandfather. Well, I, I think he has his own kids as well. Nobody write in, but he's yeah. a stepfather, father, and grandfather, I think. I think a stepfather, they have their own kids. They, they have their own kids too. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the implication is the two oldest were from a previous relationship and then the two youngest are his. Yeah, but he's just doing the classic father, grandfather thing of trying to mortify the kids now. <laughs> of knowing exactly what he's doing, knowing that this is going to be broadcast on national television, and knowing that if he has a teenager, which he does because he said it last week, that is going to be soul-destroying for them at school. And he's <laughs> going to love every second of it. Can you please give me the timestamp so I can skip this scene? Because I guarantee his teenager went into school yesterday after this episode had aired and got the piss ripped out of them for their father deep throating an ice pop on television. He gets free ice pops for life now. The scary thing is he had better technique than the women. <laughs> <laughs> I, what was with this? Why was it in slow motion? Why did we have to see Mikhail do that task in slow motion? And it zoomed in. Slow motion and zoomed in. Because they were pandering to me. Yeah, because I said this to Bindles before we started recording. Obviously, I joke most weeks that they are pandering to us. I would not be surprised if they actually were pandering to us in this challenge and just setting us up for making... Bindle's jokes, and Logan is a deviant jokes. Like, this is the absolute pinnacle of challenges for us to make jokes on this podcast, I think. They know exactly what they're doing here. It is also worth pointing out as well that the division of these two groups is the suspect list question this week. Which group was them all in either driving or getting ice cream? I did say getting ice cream rather than deep throating an ice pop. So after two attempts, Coco finally catches an ice cream, which is lemon... The ice creams only count if they're above a red line on the freezer, so they do have freezer space to store the ice creams whilst the car drivers are fucking about down below. (laughs) Hong Kong? Was that that an Italian car? (laughs) I have no idea. (laughs) Bernard and Senna get the second set correct, which is BMW and Piaggio. BMW, of course, being the most obvious logo for them given their driving BMWs. But the third one, which is Cadillac and Dacia, wrong. I think Dacia isn't Italian. Dacia is it's Eastern European of some description, I think. I have literally never heard of Dacia. Yeah, it's a very European car brand, but I I think it's actually owned by Peugeot now. But it's from Eastern Europe somewhere, the, the brand Dacia. Because huh. my dad used to have one, which is how I know this. Because <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck is a Dacia? And then I ended up Googling it. Dacia is Romanian. Ooh. Romania makes cars? Apparently so. Well, I'd I'd say Peugeot makes the Romanian cars, but yeah. They should have had the Trabant logo. Yeah, Hungarian. (laughs) Just with a question mark on it as the logo, is it going to work? Just the Trabant, the Yugo, the Skoda. Senna and Philippe then get Bugatti and Alfa Romeo wrong, but get the next two correct. They don't know Maserati, so lose another five minutes, making 20 minutes of penalties in total. They're like Sook Chai. <laughs> <laughs> it's good that you can love your own jokes. I can't even get the joke out. <laughs> you went in the ice cream zone when you made contact. <laughs> no, Rob! <laughs> Mikhail, your foot wasn't on the square when you, when your tonsils made contact with the ice pop. Another penalty. <laughs> and the best thing is, this this isn't even the best sight gag in this challenge because it's hilarious to me seeing Philippe stood in the trailer of a car. <laughs> he looks like a child. I know he's a tiny human anyway, but he looks like a child. The best part is when, um, after the challenge, when they go to the gelateria where everyone says, where the vendor says, oh, how many scoops do you want? Two scoops, two scoops, two scoops. And then Mikhail is there and he just says, ah, I'll just have one scoop. <laughs> and make it make it a really big scoop. And if you want the other scoop, you'll have to subscribe to my Conley fans. 
Bendels. So with 14 minutes left on the clock, they finally get all the cars free, the aircon gets turned up all the way to max, they have seven ice creams in the freezer, and must stick to the speed limits, obviously. When running onto the beach, Coco loses a ball, which I thought was Mikael's job, and they put six in the freezer for a total of potentially 1,500 euros of 4,000 for the challenge, if they are on time. However, they are four minutes late, so we're nothing of 4,000 euros for the challenge, really. And Bernard nearly got run over by a BMW in the process. What a good advertising spot for BMW. Also, if I was picking the banner this week, I obviously would have avoided the the predictable choice of Mikhail deep throating an ice cream. I actually probably would have gone for something at the end of this challenge, because there is a brief second where you see that Stephanie has a chin full of what I'm hoping is chocolate ice cream. <laughs> she looks like she Bruce Bogtrotted herself. Oh, wow. <laughs> you can do it, Bruce. It's only on screen for a brief amount of time, but it did really make me laugh when I was watching this episode early. Like it's full-on Andrea Belke style? Yeah. Yeah, you can see that she's obviously been carrying a chocolate ice cream and been balancing it on her face. At least I hope it's chocolate. The target is your opponent's face. I, I gotta admit, I don't blame Jill for wanting to go somewhere else for his ice cream. I mean, the delivery service is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and also, when you see how depressing the ice creams look when they're actually delivered, they just look so sad. <laughs> yeah, they just look like just massacred ice cream cones. Jill says, ah, that's why they'd say never order from food delivery services. Damn you, Grubhub. Did somebody say menu log? It's quite what I actually once said on Twitter and got a reply off menu log. No, nobody said menu log. <laughs> It might have even been in a conversation with you. I I said, did somebody say menu log? And they replied to me saying always or something. And I'm like, nobody's ever said that. Yeah. So it's day five in Mitogio. They're woken up by the calming sounds of Luciano Pavarotti at half six in the morning. Alongside the beautiful breakfast spread, there are envelopes waiting for them. Either the numbers one, two, three, or four. There are only eight seats. And everyone but Lynn, Charlotte, and Senna have surfaced already. Senna is the one who's left without a chair. He gets a special envelope, all of his own, and he leaves immediately. Can we just admire Stephanie's very poofy hair at breakfast? <laughs> yes. <laughs> My favourite thing is they never get her entire hair in the shot. It's always <laughs> half of her hair only. That's like freaking like Medusa or something that just extends into the next frame. <laughs> they should have panned right and have more of Stephanie's hair in the next frame. Maybe Medusa was in Pandora's box. Yeah, maybe. I don't know whether it's a deliberate sight gag, but until she has a shower after this, you never see her full hair. It's very funny to me. Like, even when Car Carolyn gets executed at the end of the episode when Jill and Caroline are talking by the car, there should be, like, a couple strands of Stephanie's hair poking into the edge of the frame. So what they also don't notice is that hiding around the corner at their uh, accommodation is Pandora's box, unlocked this time. And they meet Jill at Castello Normano, a notorious prison where Senna is also locked up on the top floor. Their task is to free him within an hour using fire. As long as the fire on their helmets is burning, they can free the prisoner. Once their fire is gone, so are they from the building. If they free him within an hour, they get 5,000 euros for the pot, but it is all or nothing. And Bernard decides to play his doubler, and the stakes are now 10,000 euros for freeing Senna within an hour. It is the most lucrative challenge, potentially, of Belkia history, because I'm not counting the Izzy presses a button challenge, because you were never going to get 10 grand in that challenge. And I'm also ignoring the final challenge of Greece, where it was like 50-odd grand at stake, technically, in Drachma. Also incorporated a fan. It did. So they will be storming the castle in pairs, as determined by their numbers at breakfast, and only one pair will be able to reach Senna, which could be advantageous to them. The first pair is Coco and Lynn, and Senna also has a tablet that he can't reach with the time on it, and keys he can't reach, as well as a walkie-talkie that he can reach, although nobody can hear him yet. To open the first door, they must identify which of the ten laws in front of them actually exist in Italy. Each one's attached to a rope that they must pull, and if they pull all five correct ropes, the door unlocks. On the table in the room are books glued to the table, which could help them identify it. Yeah, the laws were just ridiculous. 
uh, amongst the ten. Like one of them, which I told you guys in the chat earlier, that it's illegal in Rome to put squirrels down your pants for the purposes of gambling. It's also illegal in Rome, which is a correct answer here, to touch your crotch in public, which probably explains why you've never been to Rome, Saunders. Well, they have too many horse statues. <laughs> uh, did, my, did Michael Jackson ever do a concert in Rome? I presume they waived the law for him. It's like the uh, the law in Japan that was waived for the Olympics, where you can't go in the uh, the onsen if you got a tattoo, because it's a sign of the yakuza. They waived that for the tourists who were covered in them. I, I presume that it's, it's like how there's a difference between poor nudity and artistic nudity on TV. Yeah. So Lynn pulls a rope and finds the first correct one, which is it's illegal to keep a fish in a round fish bowl in Rome. They also find another correct one, which is the crotch in public one. The third law is that it's illegal in Ebola to kiss in a car. And Lynn pulls it to and is correct. But it's perfectly legal to kiss under a car. Yeah. Or on top of a car. And also, if the windows are steamed up enough, they can't tell you're kissing. You might just have an ice pop. Yeah. That is what people do in the uh, in the back seat of steamy windowed cars, isn't it? That's what I've been told. We're just having a snowball fight. <laughs> So Coco then pulls the wrong one, which is that in Florence it's forbidden to fly a kite, and that activates sprinklers that put their helmets out. Caroline and Philip then take over, and Caroline's candle immediately goes out as soon as she walks in the building. <laughs> Mikhail and Charlotte are the third pair, and they get it wrong as well, that in Venice you can't reverse a car on a Sunday. <laughs> I, I love she will just sort of being like, in Venice you can, of course, reverse a car on Sundays. Like, why? Well, that's just ridiculous. <laughs> well, the more ludicrous bit about that is the fact that anyone has a car in Venice, given that there are no roads in or out of Venice anymore. What would be funny is just this, uh, if it really was a law and they just cut to footage of a guy just looking around to his right, to his left, making sure no cops are around, and then he slowly backs up his car, and then there, here's the, the siren or the sound of the police, whoop, and the whoop. guy's like, damn it! Damn it! <laughs> I thought I was in the clear. Oh, why didn't I wait till Monday? Son of a bitch. <laughs> so Bernard and Stephanie are the fourth pair in. They get another correct one, which is that it is illegal to wear clogs or other noisy shoes in Capri. And Stephanie's candle goes out when she pulls a falsehood that in Tolmina, you can only sit on a bench for 15 minutes. There are just three options left for Coco and Lynn when they return. They find the correct one, which is that in Iraklia it is illegal to make sandcastles. However, Coco's candle goes out when they pull the fifth law, and it is Caroline and Philippe that are the first to go to the second floor. How do you think you would have done with the pitch around? I would have been pretty confident that Joe da Costa hadn't kidnapped the president's daughter and that he hadn't been to prison. Um, but maybe... Maybe he had been to prison because he reversed his car in Venice on a Sunday during a vacation. While wearing clocks. Yeah. I figured it was going to be just like like a trick question. Like maybe they went to a prison in one of the, you know, 78 Vietnam War themed challenges that season. I mean, it would have been the ultimate reveal if Gilles had gone, yeah, actually, I, I did go to prison for a few days because I had a bar fight. That's not that well known. I got it in a, in a fight with T-Bold. I got in a paddle match with him. <laughs> she would have cost a stuck a squirrel down his pants. For the purposes of gambling. I'm also impressed that neither of you replied with, that's a paddling. <laughs> you better believe that's a paddling. Reversing your car in Venice on a Sunday, that's a paddling. <laughs> Wearing wooden clogs, that's a paddling. Building sandcastles, oh, you better believe that's a paddling. <laughs> yeah, I think most of them were fairly <laughs> obvious. Wrong answers or right answers. Al Capone, yeah. obviously, famously did go to prison, to Alcatraz specifically, but not for any mafia-related thing. It was because of tax evasion. That sort of thing. Yeah, but like, would you have been able to identify Al Capone from the photo? I yeah. would, only because I've been to Alcatraz. I've done the tour. It was not the cheapest tour in the world that I've ever done, but it was feckin' fascinating going around Alcatraz. I thought you were going to say you went to Alcatraz because you stuck a squirrel down your pants for the purposes of gambling. I can neither confirm nor deny that I did get sent to Alcatraz for doing that. Were you guys aware of the unaired, uh, unaired challenge bit where they had to postpone the challenge by an hour because uh, Senna got his mustache stuck in a pencil sharpener? 
they're going to miss a trick in the Mafia theme challenge next week if they don't put Senna in a pinstripe suit. I'm sorry. It's an absolute crime if they don't give him a fedora in a pinstripe suit for a Mafia theme challenge. Although, to be fair, they did postpone the challenge for an hour and a half because Senna was caught in traffic on his way there. Yeah, good point. The other thing that I do want to mention is they're doing behind-the-scenes clips on the website now. They're doing like a almost a spin-off show of behind-the-scenes clips that you can watch on the website called Demol Behind the Scenes, which last week actually showed the logistics of how they got people on the boat and stuff. It was very interesting. Oh, yeah? How did they do it? It was essentially having them... On a, on a school bus and pulling them off one at a time, I think. Huh. But they even showed Van Bull having to to take people one at a time to go for a loo break before they actually went on the boat, because obviously, if you're hanging off a mast, it's not that easy to go to the bathroom from there. Well, it's easy to go from there, it's just not easy to, you know, keep the poop deck clean. Yeah, it would have been only the second least sanitary thing on this season already. After, obviously, deep throating the ice pops. So they find 10 pictures of famous people and must light a candle for the people who've never been to prison. They also have the walkie-talkie with which they can talk to Senna, not that they even pay any attention to his repeated attempts to get them to contact him or even pay attention to him or work out that, you know, he's going to be rather helpful in this section of the challenge. Did they have a behind-the-scenes video of how they got that giant fan upstairs? I've not seen the the behind-the-scenes clips of this week yet, but I wouldn't be surprised. Did anyone else laugh really hard at seeing Paris Hilton and then the, remember the story of Paris Hilton being in prison from 20 years ago? Yeah, and then I felt really old at realizing that it was 20 years ago. Yeah, I was thinking, because uh, I remembered after, it took me a second, like, oh yeah, that was a long time ago. Yeah, I, I remember she did uh, one of the late night shows, I think it was Letterman, sort of just after she got out. She's like, oh, I don't want to talk about prison. And, and then David Letterman was like, Oh, but that's all I want to talk about. <laughs> it's literally the reason you're here. Yeah. We're not going to talk about House of Wax, Paris. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about your one day of prison sentence that somehow counted as 12 days. <laughs> I once got forced to watch a clip from House of Wax. It was disgusting. It was one of those near the end of term things, and we had to sort of advocate for our favourite film in English class, and someone brought in House of Wax and showed a clip of a finger getting chopped off. It was disgusting. I'm not good with horror anyway, but yeah. That surprises me. Forced watching horror, no thank you. That was with, uh, yeah, that was uh, Alicia Cuthbert's uh, big film debut uh, after she became famous in 24. Yeah. So Caroline's candle goes out when they try to light Jill's fire. Charlotte's candle also goes out and they argue about whether to actually talk to Senna or not. And after a few failed attempts, Senna turns the fan off and makes their lives easier. However, yet again, Caroline and Philippe really struggle to get Gilles fire lit. <laughs> Gilles then confirms to us that he's never been to prison. And Senna also finds hints on his cell walls as to whose candle should not be lit. He passes on the smells like teen spirit clue, but Lynn shuts him down, incorrectly answering Kurt Cobain, and turning the fan back on again. Who who lit the Kurt Cobain candle again? Lynn. It was Lynn. That is, it's Kurt Cobain. I, I would that would be like a general rule that uh, not to um, you know not to be discriminatory towards uh, punk rock musicians and grunge musicians, but if I have to pick five out of ten people out of the lineup that have been in prison, uh, I think I'm going to go with Kurt Cobain as one of the five. Especially when the field includes some guy named Arno, uh, Jill da Costa, and uh, and Elton John, <laughs> Sir Elton John. Yeah, it was Elton John, Paris Hilton, Al Capone. I can't remember who the others were. Oh, some Italian prime minister. Some Italian prime minister. Only the only one of the most <laughs> hilarious people in worldwide <laughs> politics for a lot of the wrong reasons before anyone writes in but yeah silvio berlusconi famous for his and i quote bunga bunga parties <laughs> i believe at one point he filled his cabinet with um, with nude models yeah he has a an interesting story shall we say although to be fair mikhail was invited and now it's only a bunga party very very true but yeah, just calling him some prime minister. 
is doing him a slight disservice for his services to comedy worldwide. Wasn't the Bunga Bunga party, wasn't that in the first episode of the last season of Amazing Race Asia? Oh, wait, no, those were Undle Undles. The Undle Undle Bundles. My favourite visual from the entire challenge, though, is how knackered Senna looks from having to constantly hop backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards <laughs> all over his cell for an hour. Because he looks absolutely pooped when he just keeps having to run back over to the fan and then come back to the walkie-talkie and instruct people and then we'll run back to the fan. Is he a human being or a kangaroo? But eventually, Philippe and Caroline get four of the five correct and they light Silvio Berlusconi in a correct opening the door. They have four minutes to free Senna and find a board with the pairs listing the chance of personal gain that evening. Currently, it's in the order that they sat at breakfast, but it is very easy to swap them around. Caroline is honest about Senna having a 0% chance at the moment, and he gives her the hammer from his cell. They have two minutes left. He lights his candle with Philippe's end to light the fuse and free himself. The board is locked in, and they are four minutes late, meaning yet again, zero euros, this time out of 10,000 for the challenge. And Senna seems really pissed off that he has done all that work for zero reward. And after a fiasco at the Castello, which is a wonderful phrase from Gilles in the voiceover, they have a lovely, relaxing ride back to their accommodation, where waiting for them are the two things you don't want to see on this show, Gilles de Costa and Pandora's Box. He tells them that everything comes back, and in that case, so does Pandora's Box. Whether the mole's name's in it, though, he doesn't know. Well, he does, but he's not confirming to them. Regardless, what is inside is very tempting, but if they don't open the box, they will earn 2,000 euros. If they do, there are severe consequences. If this was a Canadian reality show and they said there's something tempting in this box, it wouldn't even be pass bragging or an exemption. It would just be like, skip the dishes, uh, coupons, and uh, keys to a Chevrolet vehicle, and uh, a bunch of cliff bars. But luckily, Belgian Mulder are a lot more subtle with the sponsors with uh, BMW, so you know it's actually going to be applicable to the game. It would be a tablet allowing them to pick their Wendy's breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> Who's taking Lynn to Wendy's? <laughs> Two things to point out here. Number one, 2,000 euros is the amount of money that Pandora's box is worth when it wasn't opened last time. So that's why it's 2,000 euros rather than anything higher. Number two, do you actually think there were eight past Fragen in there last time? No. Because we obviously had quite a conversation last week about whether the consequences of Pandora's Box would be the same and whether the contents of Pandora's Box would be the same. I don't think the contents were the same, and I would actually put money on the consequences not being the same, at least in terms of how it's structured. It may still have been a pot drain, in which case that would have been hilarious, given as, as someone said on Discord before we recorded this, they started at minus 1200 in Greece when Pandora's Box happened. I dread to think how low Bart would have made it go. But they also didn't have that computery, everyone tap their thumbprint setup for Pandora's Box in uh, in Greece. So I think the structure would have been slightly different. Maybe the consequences would have been the same, but the structure wasn't. I did not recognize that really short, uh, white-haired woman from the Greece season when they went flashback to the Pandora's Box. How can you not remember else? <laughs> the irony is I think she was on your team that season. <laughs> Maybe I suppress that memory. <laughs> yeah, as you guys well know, I was looking through the uh, the previous pools to come up with a wall of shame at the weekend. I think we may have done a pool for Vietnam, and I can't find any trace of it. So I'm just assuming that that we didn't do one properly. But from China onwards, I have the pool records and have been showing them off this weekend. But I, th- I think Elsa was on your team. I'm not 100%, but... Did she go home that episode? Uh, she went home very early, yeah. Yeah, I was about to say, I'm like, I have a pretty good memory of the people from the Greece season, and uh, I don't think she made it very far. Actually, no, she didn't go home that episode, because that was Bruno who went home that episode, because that was starting your streak of losing. Oh, the super fan. Oh, right. He was the one who started your streak of losing the first person every single year. Hmm. So she must have gone home episode three then. Yeah, she went home early anyway. So they will come to the box in pairs in a new order decided by Caroline and Philippe when Senna was freed. They will be the first pair, followed by Senna and Mikael, Stephanie and Charlotte, and Coco and Bernard. Lynn has no pair, and therefore no chance to open the box. 
Oh, same as Mikhail. <laughs> <laughs> I just got it. <laughs> Took you a few seconds, Bindles. <laughs> I got it, but I was trying to ignore it. <laughs> so as long as the box stays closed, the next pair will be woken up for their dilemma. And they did say that they did the order based on the level of trust, and Lynn did some ridiculous things, so they didn't trust her. And Lynn is really annoyed that she's been sidelined. She was the only one who wouldn't have looked, so it was a bad decision on their part. Charlotte and Stephanie say they will absolutely open it if they get the chance. Lynn was furious with the order. She said, I, I got, she's, and it's true, she got, was it three out of five or four out of five? It was several out of five. Seven? I think it was four? She said four. But I... I think it was three and then her and Coco got the uh, the last one, but then Coco's candle went out straight away. Yeah, because Carolyn says, I don't know, Lynn. I just don't trust you. There's something off with you. And she said, I, I was the only one who did really well during the last challenge, and I'm the one that has to be solo. Yeah. And then Carolyn's just th- standing there thinking, um, uh, well, I guess I, no, I still don't trust you. <laughs> so at 3 a.m., Caroline and Philly for the first to wake up. If they keep the box closed, it is worth 2,000 euros. If they don't, they will get eight pass fragging. She tells him not to look at it short term. Opening it would cause so much trouble trust-wise. He would be inclined to do it if he was on his own. But she says no, so they don't. Yeah, because Philippe wanted to ultimately open in it, or open the box. Yeah, if Philippe had been given a solo dilemma here, he would have opened the box. Yeah. At 3.30am, Senna and Mikhail get the wake-up call. They get the same offer, but decide 8 pass for Argon is much more useful than 2,000 euros, and they open Pandora's box. Of course, it is my top two suspects who are doing the most suspicious thing. There was no hesitation. They just instantly decided. Well, Charlotte and Stephanie were for sure going to open it too if it got to their turn. They said, if "We're going to open the box if it makes it if it makes it to us in the rotation." But yeah, there was no there was no hesitation here either with Senna and, and Mikhail. They started laughing like little schoolgirls uh, while they were when they were opening the box. I mean, going into this, I'd assumed the mole was going to play differently than Alina did in Greece, in that the mole would be open, depending on whether their partner in this case was, to opening Pandora's box. I'm pretty sure that the mole opened Pandora's box in this case, but was willing to open Pandora's box here as well. If nothing else, it answers the fan question of what would have happened if Pandora's box opened. Because they would have had to bring it back a third time to taunt people, I think, if it hadn't got opened. Yeah. So the screen then changes to show the pot. Everyone must press the screen at the same time to stop the pot draining. I like how they didn't initially catch on that all nine needed to press the button because Sen and Mike, Mikhail didn't think that production would be that cruel to them, that they would have to wake up and out themselves for opening Pandora's box. So they try to do what the two thumbprints at first, and then it hits them. Oh, no. Not only do we have to wake everybody up at 3.30 in the morning, but simultaneously we have to expose ourselves for opening up Pandora's box. If Senna or Mikael are the mole, I guarantee in the finale or reunion we will see a clip of them just strolling through the compound going, I'm not going to wake Lynn up just yet. I'm going to let it wait for a minute or so. Let it drain a little bit more. There will be some cocky bullshit to the camera, and I am putting money on it if one of them two is the mole. Clearly, there there was something very moly there. Somebody was supposed to wake Lynn up that didn't. Yes. And it allows Senna and Mikhail to look like the heroes, because they then conveniently find where room 14 is, and Mikhail gives her a piggyback down to the screen, because she can't see it, because she's not got contacts in. I don't have my contacts in. Get on my back. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> So the pot stops draining at 5,640 euros, meaning they lost 3,160 euros of 2,000 in this challenge, minus 3,160 of 16,000 for the episode, and 5,640 euros of 36,000 for the season so far. Are they Flemish or Dutch? (laughs) The the crazy pot drain and it's episode two. And I'm sure anyone listening especially after the last Dutch season, is going to expect me to go, oh, pot drains, I hate them. I do hate pot drains. I'm not a big fan of this pot drain, but it is the best possible pot drain they could do, I think. 
Yeah. It still very much fits the the Belgian theme and attitude and production style of Actions Have Consequences. It's definitely one of those things where I go, don't do this again. But I, I can give minor grumbles about it rather than the full-on, this is just bullshit, production-induced nonsense. Yeah. Belgian Mole is very good at not having loose ends. Had the Pandora's box twist has been a loose end for a few years. Yeah, and assuming that those pictures of Pandora's box in front of the church in Greece and stuff were real, they've had this in the back pocket for four years. They've been dying to do this. <laughs> so to recap, for Lady and Ice Cream, good. Opening a box, bad. Yeah, pretty much. The thing I will say comparing it to Vidim last season is I hated the Vidim one because it was production-induced bullshit and the team really couldn't have done anything about it. If Senor or Mikael are the mole, it's the team's own damn fault that this happened because Caroline and Philly had the choice to not put both of them early on or indeed stop at least one of them getting to that box. Number two, Caroline and Philippe again had the option to stop them and preempt it. <laughs> they didn't do it. It's the team's own damn fault that this this happened. Compared to Vidum, where they couldn't really do much to stop either the old mole or indeed the new mole being a dick to the mole about the money. So Gilles returns, and I'm sure he loved his 3:30 a.m. wake up call. He looked. He, he was very well dressed. He looked much more awake than everybody else. He did look very tired, though. Yeah, he he won't have gone to bed. It'll he'll have just been sat in the tent waiting for it to happen. I think he'll have seen on the uh, on the confessional cams that Stephanie and Charlotte were definitely going to open it, and that um, I'm presuming Senna and Mikhail both said they were going to open it as well. So he knew that this was going to happen. I do wonder what time the execution was the next morning, because it was still morning, I think. I don't think it was super early, but I certainly don't think many people in production got much sleep that day. So it's now time for the test. 20 questions about the identity and actions of the mole, who have no least goes home, except for the mole who can never go home. Senna and Mikhail both have four pass Fragen to play on this test. Philippe says he's disappointed the box was opened, as he underestimated Senna and Mikhail. Senna listened to the rest, and more than enough of them admitted that they would have opened it, so he's happy that they took matters into their own hands. Bernard didn't speak once on the walkie-talkie. If it's there, it must have been useful, so he must have been avoiding it. Caroline understands why they went for it, but if it was going to come out of the pot anyway, she'd rather have had the advantage herself. Stephanie doesn't think the mole opened the box. She's got an eye on Coco and Lynn. Charlotte says the mole knew the pot drain was coming, so they could earn trust and make people look elsewhere. And Mikael says Bernard was determined to win, so he played the doublet, but he's not been ruled out. He has four pass for Argon, so he's feeling confident. Lynn says Caroline and Philippe told them not to use the walkie-talkie, so that's a serious sabotage. Bernard says that Coco creates chaos and doesn't understand. That's more behaviour. And Coco didn't need the pass for Argon, but she's happy for them. She did a Coco, and she went all in. We then get a pre-execution diary of the mole. I'm so happy with everything that happened. Especially that the double was... Um, I need to do this properly in the Darth Vader voice, really, don't I, after last week? I'm so happy. I thought it was Bane. The... Yeah, it was Bane last week, and I actually ended up in the edit um, putting my voice down a, a couple of octaves just to, you know, make it more molish. I'm so happy with everything that happened, especially that the double was wasted. They're going to eliminate someone soon at the elimination. Yes, hopefully to the eliminated contestant. Then we're done with it. Yes, but you know we'll never tell you in advance who that'll be. No, but I can hope. That would be perfect. All the double is gone. Your lack of faith disturbs me. Yeah, why do uh, you think the mole would just intimidate Jill the cost into giving up who the LMA contestant is? Tell me. Tell me, Jill. <laughs> yep. The reason that you don't see anything from the diaries of the mole is because the mole does have Jill in a force choke at that point. Yeah. And Jill says that it was a special night with some consequences. More than a third of the pot melted away in an episode where they earned nothing anyway. The mole will be very satisfied. Before the execution, Bernard has to give up his doublers and choose who is the role, and he picks Lynn. I wish he would just say, can we use random.org, Jill? <laughs> <laughs> I've randomly picked a number from one to eight. Everyone pick a number. <laughs> or can we do one of those marble race randomizers? Everyone <laughs> pick them. <laughs> Mikhail was like, I'll be your friend. And then he was like, Oh, well, I've seen what you do to your friends, and no thanks. 
<laughs> My body is not an ice pop, Mikhail. <laughs> Get on your knees and make me your friend. <laughs> so Lynn gets the first green screen, followed by Coco and Philippe, before Caroline gets the red screen, just as we predicted. And Philippe is upset. Just older women on... Unless you're unless you're uh, Annalise, not not the show for you. No, she regrets it, but she had a chance for Hall Pass Fragon and didn't take them, so it's all her own fault. It was a fantastic adventure, albeit one a bit too short. And Jill says they're losing a lot of humor, a lot of spirit, and he's glad they're not fighting. She has a trained arm with a hammer. She leaves with her chewy branded luggage. Subtle sponsorship, ahoy! <laughs> I I don't know what was the funniest eulogy here. Philippe's saying she told um, him she'd have no regrets as soon as she told Jill she's got regrets. Or Coco being like, she said she was 46. I'm like, what? You're so cool, but you're old. You're five years above the age where you should have a grandchild. Yeah. And Jill reveals to us at the end of the episode that everything comes back, including the fact that the mole's name was hidden on the box this time rather than in the hidden compartment in the box. It was written in invisible ink and visible on the black light hidden under the table. Do you think that light was there the whole time? Yeah, I don't think they would. I don't think they would deceive us about that. No, that that light was definitely there all the time. It's just hilarious that Pandora's box came back, and then nobody expected any sort of trick here. My suspicion is that we will also see a scene, regardless of whether it's Senna or Mikael or someone else, of the mole coming back to the box later. Because that box was left open when everyone went back to bed. There's going to be some shenanigans where the mole comes back out and goes, oh, I can read my own name here. Or something like that. So next time, they finally embrace the mafia. Coco needs some more stamina. Someone gets a tattoo. And Jill announces the revenge of Don Salvadori. I wish with Carolyn that they would have pulled an arrested development of I've heard it saying, oh, I, I don't think we're making a huge mistake with uh, not taking the pass fragon. And then at, as soon as the red screen comes up, I've made a huge mistake. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, she. this would have been a bit more gut-wrenching if it was Philippe who got executed here. Because it wasn't his decision to not open Pandora's box. But given that Carolyn agreed to, or she was the one who campaigned to not open Pandora's box and she was the one who got executed. She only has herself to blame here for her own elimination. Yeah. The one thing we did forget to mention before I go into all the usual admin stuff is the Wilhelm scream when Senna's fuse goes off. Yes, because like, I messaged you guys the second I heard it. <laughs> it's two episodes in a row with the Wilhelm scream. Is it weird that like I haven't heard it either time? I've had to go back and listen to it after you've pointed it out. I didn't spot it this week. I knew there was one this week because someone mentioned it on Discord. But it's been in both of the episodes now. Is it going to be a clue of some description? Can I just take a second to appreciate that I spotted something that you guys didn't? No. Okay. <laughs> 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 to quote Lewis Cologne, <laughs> moving on. Yeah. <laughs> As you may have spotted on social media, our pool has been finalized. I drafted Senna, Mikael, Coco, and Caroline, and Logan drafted Stephanie, Charlotte, Philippe, and Bernard, leaving Lynn as the leftover. As Caroline was eliminated this week, uh, Lynn joins my team in her place. We've got to work out a way for me to be in the pool next year. Yeah, the problem is the draft order. Yeah. Maybe going back to the execution, you draw a number. Mm. We'll work something out, but yeah. yeah marble probably, race. Yeah, maybe we marble race for it. But yeah, we, we probably <laughs> actually should find a way to get you in the pool, to be honest. Saves us doing leftovers in week two every single year. Interestingly, sort of, if we use Lynn as the middle line, because she is the middle alphabetically of the final nine, uh, we each drafted two men and two women, we also each drafted two people from either side of the Lin line. And um, actually, in terms of the first suspicions and stuff, for a long time, we actually alternated on the, the list. I think I had first, third, fifth, and seventh, and Saunders had two, four, six, eight for pretty much all of first suspicions. It changed at the last second. But it was very interesting how evenly matched we, we kind of were. 
mm. um, for much of the week. On the subject of first suspicions, thank you to everyone who submitted first suspicions. I think it actually is a record number of first suspicions. We had loads this year, which is amazing. Uh, Senna is the most suspected with 3.68 out of 9, followed by Charlotte on 3.89, Coco on 4.46, Mikhail on 4.57, Stephanie on 4.61, Philippe on 5.5, Caroline on 5.67, Bernard on 6.04, and Lynn on 6.68. With Caroline's departure, there is no order change, but Senna is now on 3.43 out of 8, Charlotte on 3.57, Coco on 4.14, Mikhail on 4.18, Stephanie on 4.25, Philippe on 4.96, Bernard on 5.46 and Lynn on a dead six. Four people, Matthew Mole, April Bride 15, Alan and our very own Logan Saunders have a perfect start to the season by putting Caroline in ninth. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's the one bit of positive thing you get from me this week, Saunders. I am the smartest man alive. Given it is 10 to 1 in the morning. No one had her as a first suspicion, but three people, Aaron, Natalie and Lone, all had her at number two. You can do this week's Suspect List with Bob the Bar at suspectlist.rtvwarriors.com or the link in our bio. And as I've said, the question is, which team was the Molon? Were they jerking off ice pops or were they driving cars in the first challenge? Last week, Flanders suspects, I don't know whether you guys saw this, it was very close. Bernard was on 14%, Mikhail, Charlotte and Senna were all on 13 Caroline and Philippe were on 11 Stephanie was on 10 Coco on 9 and Lynn on 6 Caroline was that high? Yeah, Caroline had 11%. She was actually ahead of Philippe. I presume they were in the order of um, of suspicion. But yeah, both her and Philippe were on 11%. Wow. That's dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, we're recording this on a, uh, on a Tuesday, so we don't have this week's suspicions, but I will mention them next week. <laughs> They were wrong. Yeah, they were wrong, indeed. <laughs> Final two questions, as always. Who do you suspect and who's going home? So, suspect list, really quickly. I have Stephanie at number one, Senna in two, uh, Mikhail in the third spot, Charlotte fourth, Bernard fifth, Coco in sixth, Lynn in seventh, and Philippe in eighth. And I predict that... Charlotte will be executed. Uh, I've still got Mikhail at the top. Then Coco, Senna, Charlotte, Philippe, Bernard, Stephanie, and Lynn. I feel like Stephanie, because she was focusing all on two people that are pretty much ruled out. So, Yeah. And my suspect list is Senna, Mikhail, and Coco. You know, top three, all on my team, obviously. Then Philippe, Stephanie, Charlotte, Bernard, and Lynn. And I think it's going to be Philippe or Charlotte next week. Interesting how our suspicions have kind of diversified a lot this week. Yeah. There's no new suspects, but they're all moving around a lot. And I don't have anything else to really add, especially about the Illuminate contestant, Carolyn, other than to say, she gone! I was waiting for that. I'll also point out as an Easter egg for you guys, I did do a She Gone in Hunted yesterday. Oh, good. <laughs> as I said, the streams were colliding a little bit, and uh, yeah, I did a She Gone this week for, for Hunted. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else you guys want to say? No, I'm good. No. Excellent news. In that case, thank you for listening to our Demol Belkia Season 12 recap. We'll be back next week to continue the hunt for the newest mall in Sicily. Don't forget you can contact us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram, where we are RTV Warriors, or you can email us and contact us at rtvwarriors.com. Logan is on the artist formerly known as Twitter at Logs of Wacky. Bindles is a Grim Recapper, and I'm Major Halftone. Thank you to our legion of subtitlers. We will see you next week. Peace out and just chill till the next of flavoring. Either way, it was a stick shift. We gone. <laughs>